Welcome to Waldworth History on Film, a program presented by the Waldworth Area Historical Society and designed to record the oral history of Waldworth for posterity. I'm Cesar Carino, your host, and our guest today is J.D. Henson, former mayor of Waldworth. J.D., you look awfully hale and hearty for a man who's 80 years of age. Right. 80 years of age. And as you know, J.D., I know you have another name, but I've never called you anything but J.D., so I guess we'll just keep on calling you J.D. As a matter of fact, anybody in town who says the word J.D., we automatically think of you. As you know, we are trying to record for posterity the history of Wadsworth. And even though you were not native of Wadsworth, you've been here for 60, what, 60, uh, almost 60? 1940, 57 years. 57 years, and, and, but the most important thing here was you are, were the mayor for what, two terms? Yes. Two terms. There are three living former mayors of Wadsworth, and much to our, our dismay, you're the only one who's physically able to, um, to be interviewed. Don Merriman, who is 93 or 4 years old right now, said that he just physically could not do it. And Earl Gottwald, uh, who, how old would Earl be now? Is he older or younger than you? Oh, I think he's probably a year old, young, older than me. So he's about 81 years I old. I think so. I'm so, not sure. Yeah. I, I never... But he's in the same, yeah, same ballpark. Yeah. And Earl, uh, living in Barberton right now, um, his wife Eileen called and said she didn't think that he could do it. So. The whole responsibility of former mayors for the next hour, J.D., is going to be on your shoulders. Okay. We have to say, uh, let's start from when, why you came to Wadsworth. Now, you, you came to Wadsworth in 1939, the same year that your wife, Cora Ford, graduated from high school. Is that correct? Uh, did you right. come because of that, or did you come from Well, I, I, I guess it was because Cora attended college in our hometown. Which was where? Uh, Columbia, Kentucky. Lindsay Wilson is a Methodist college. Lindsay, what's the name of the college? Lindsay Wilson College. Lindsay. Lindsay. Oh, Lindsay. L I D N S E Y. And uh, she and Betty Phelps. Betty Phelps, who's Jack Hollenbach's wife. Right. And when they started school, they graduated in the spring and they come to Kentucky to college. And But I had known Cora before. How did you know her? Through her folks here in Wadsworth. I, I had a brother lived here, and I've been here to visit him, and I met them, and uh, I knew the Ford family. The Fords were from Kentucky, originally, and I knew all of her folks on her parents on her father's side. I see. And her mother was a Houston, one of the largest families in the city of Wadsworth. Which Houston family? Joe Houston and how Don about Houston, Mope, and. Uh, uh, G uh, young Joe Houston, Roy Houston, Roy Houston, Lonnie Houston, Lonnie Houston. How about Bill, uh, how about Willard Houston? Yes, mm -hmm. they and, were all relatives. And uh, then she's also related to uh, Myrtle Houston. Yes, uh, Myrtle's now dead. Yes, uh, she's Myrtle Reese uh, yes. when she died. Yes. And uh, who are some of the other descendants of the Houston family, which is a, a very old family in Boston? Yeah, there's Fair Houston and. Uh, you mentioned Myrtle and uh, Lonnie Houston, mm -hmm. uh, Gordon Houston, Gordon Houston. Uh, Joe and Mope, of course, Donald. And, who, uh, who worked at the Buick Garage? Which Houston? Willard Houston. Willard Houston worked at the Buick Garage. Correct. Uh, and the Buick Garage at that time was owned by whom? That could have been 48. Forey Wright is correct. I mean, yeah, Forey yeah, Wright. Yeah. And it was located right next to where Central School is right now in that alley. Yeah. There was an alley there. Yes. Yeah, and um, Forey Wright had the Buick, <laughs> excuse me, the Buick Garage. So those were all Cora's relatives. All of them were, yeah. So you didn't, uh, you remind me of, um, of my own wife who was not born in Wadsworth, but she said that she got here as fast as she could. <laughs> you um, you got here at a very young age, at yes. age about 18 or so? No, I was 22. Well, 22 when you got here, yeah. but Cora was only well, Cora 18, is, 19. Cora's birthday was yesterday. She was 76 and I'm 76 eight. years yeah. old. Yeah. God, yeah. that's wonderful. She was born <laughs> yesterday. Um, <clears throat> what did you do when you came to Wadsworth? Well, I got a job at the high injector company. I was employed with the uh, Department of Transportation in the state of Kentucky, the great commonwealth, and uh, 
I was up here for the holidays, coming December 39. In fact, I come on 19th of December. And after Christmas, they started hiring at the injector, and they slowed down the Department of Transportation. So I went down and uh, put in an application to the high injector company and was hired pretty soon after I put the application in. Do you remember which department it was that you were, that you first? The grinding and cleaning department. Grinding and cleaning. And who yeah. were some of the people who worked in it? Did Chuck Long work in that area? Chuck Long worked in that area. Ori Lichty worked in that area. Ori Lichty. And George King worked in that area. George Johnny Troyan. John Troyan. Oh, well, there was a bunch of them. That was, um, where they were located in kind of a hallway, weren't they? Yes. Between the shipping department mm -hmm. and the uh, manufacturing department. Part of it was in the old foundry down, the old down, foundry. By, the, down by the uh, injector hill sidewalk. Who, uh, who were some of the, uh, the people in the injector at the time at the top? Oh, Lloyd Hartzell. Lloyd Hartzell. Hartzell. Yeah, I remember him very well. He Lloyd made, Hartzell was the personnel director, is that correct? Yeah, he's a little reluctant to hire me. I wanted to go in machining, and he said I was too short to run a lathe. <laughs> you were too short to run a lathe? You wouldn't be able to say that. He soon person. found out I could. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, how tall do you have to be to run a lathe? Gee, I don't know. <laughs> I know some was in there quite a bit shorter than me. Yeah. Uh, Lloyd had his own ideas about things. He did. He did, he, about hiring, and about it was hiring. his business. <laughs> it was his business, that's right. Yeah. Who was in charge at the top, do you remember? Wayne Young. Wayne Young was still at the top mm -hmm. then. And uh, who was your boss? When well, you my, my department head boss was Orrin Hanchett. Orrin Hanchett, mm -hmm. Orrin Hanchett. And Oren's wife was Frances Hanchett, and they mm -hmm. lived on Ohio Avenue. Or Fair True. Ohio, yeah, Ohio yeah, Avenue, as yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah. Way back then. Oren's dead, of course, and, yeah. and uh, Frances is dead. Yeah. Frances was a Siffert, and uh, her brother, uh, Tony Siffert, was head of the pattern department. True. And, uh, and in the pattern department was one of the finest craftsmen that ever the Wadsworth ever knew for making um, uh, patterns, and that was his brother. Um, Al Sifford. Al Sifford. Uh, Al Sifford is also the company carpenter. He was the company carpenter. Absolutely excellent. He made some of the most beautiful things. I remember Al Sifford made a candlestick out of a piece of uh, ash that he found in a pig pen. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the most revered pieces of uh, woodworking I've ever seen. Just absolutely beautiful. So Orrin Hanchett was a brother-in-law to the Sifferts. So the, the Hanchets and the Sifferts all worked at the injector, you and you worked there as well. Do you remember who the uh, boss was over Orrin Hanchett? He was your, your department head, but who, over, who was over him? Do you remember? Over the division? Gee, I don't know. Don't remember that one, right? I, I don't recall other than you would move out to the front office and there's possibly a little young, or, or, uh, Wayne Young's brother, uh, Irv Young. Irv Young, Irv Young, Irvin Young. He could have been over the okay. entire. Now, um, as we talk about the injector um, and uh, the fact that you started out as a grinder, but then you didn't stay there as a grinder very long, did you? No. What did you do then afterwards? Well, I, I, I talked to Mr. Hanchett on many occasions and finally got transferred to the machining. And who was your boss at the machine shop then? Jim Mager. Jim Mager. Big Jim. Big Jim. Big Jim Mager. And he had uh, brothers, uh, Sid Mager, and uh, they used to call him Mooney Mager because he had one eye that drooped a little. No, that was George. Uh, George was the Mooney Mager? He lived on uh, uh, Bergy Street. On Bergy Street, okay. Right. Then, then he called him Mooney Maker. Yeah, because but he did have another brother, Sid, that worked there, and he was in White Collar. He's in the office. Yes, George Maker is Mooney Maker. You're right, That's you're right. right. And he, had mar he, he married um, uh, Edna Santee, yes. didn't he? Yes. Edna Santee, who now died, who's now dead. Hadn't been gone too long. No, not. Uh, she lived to be 96 or 97 yeah, no, years old. Well. I knew her real well. Yeah, she, uh, as a matter of fact, she was born on, um, uh, I believe, um, October of 1895, so she would be about 102 years old right now if she were living. And Mooney Mager uh, died um, many, many years ago. Quite and Sid Mager was also heavily involved with the injector, was he? Oh, not? you bet. And all of his, he had four sons and they worked there. And your boss was? Uh, J uh, Jim Mager. Jim Mager, right. Jim Mager. And you were in the machine department now. Yes. Now, I'd like to have you explain to us, for posterity, 
about the machines as they are now. Um, I recently visited a factory and the machines were all done by, by robots. I mean, everything was done automatically, it was done com by computers and so forth. Who was the computer at your machine? I guess I was. You were. And what did you do? How did you do it? And what was well, I, we were machining brass parts for brass valves. And then we got into other metals and we machined them and make the parts and then they went on out to the fitting room. Could you, could you give us just a quick thumbnail sketch of um, what part you did? Uh, so we get a picture 50 years from now or 100 years from now how uh, the valves were manufactured. Well, I was so. operating a, uh, what they call a turret lathe when I first went into machining. Let's explain a turret lathe. And it was very diversified. You, you machine uh, a bonnet to a valve, a body to a valve, a wedge to a valve, a, a union nut to a valve, a packing nut to a valve. All, all the parts, you did all, each one of them, there's a different setup for each one. You'd go to the crib and get different tools to, to cut these things. And you, you would know what to do, but there was a highly skilled operation. Well, us. actually it was semi skill, I think, machining and it's production, you know. Mm -hmm. Surely, but you, you, you did that. Yes. Now, who, who were some of the people who worked with you at the injector right there? Well, George Meager, Clyde Swagger, Tom Foster. Uh, a couple of the Cliffords, Elton Clifford Elton. and, and, and uh, Blake. Blake, Blake Lowell and Blake Lyle Johnson and uh, Tom, did I mention Tom Foster? He was really yeah. old. They, they, they worked there then until they, they couldn't dropped. work anymore. Well, yeah, they worked till the mid 80s quite a few of them. Yeah. I, I worked and all the great craftsmen in the brass cutting. Who were some of the great craftsmen that you considered the brass cutting? I guess maybe one of the better ones is Duff Stoller. Duff Stoller. Mm -hmm. and what was his real name? I don't know. I, I, I've never called him anything but Duff. Did you know Duff? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then we had uh, uh, Claude Walsh. Claude he was Walsh. quite a craftsman. He cut brass and he, he knew what he was doing too. Mm -hmm. the, um, how many years did you work at the injector before you became active in politics? Well, let me see, how many years? 20 years. 20 years. Then you became active in politics. What was the first thing that you do it did in politics? Well, maybe how I got involved here. I, I was in politics in Kentucky. I worked for the Department of Transportation, as I said, and I, that was under Governor A.B. Happy Chandler, and I campaigned for him when I was 15 years old. No kidding. <clears throat> and that's how I got started in politics. And then... Uh, when I got to Wadsworth and got drafted into the Army, well, when we had a, quite a, a rehab program here for the soldiers who'd come home, you know, it, many of them had uh, needed attention, health problems of all kinds. And My eldest brother being one of them because he was severely wounded. In yeah, service. and Dr. Swick was our doctor. Dr. Lewis Zwick. Anytime you call on him, he knew the admitting doctor at Crow. And he would call there, and we'd call Hilliard's funeral home. The patient be on his way before we even got through with the conversation. That's it worked. It worked. It was great. <clears throat> we, are, we probably will not have much of an opportunity to talk about Dr. Zwick at any other time, but you knew him well, did you? Very know? well. He was one of the greatest. I, I, anytime I wanted to contact it, at Crowell, I was the service director at that time at the VFW. A VFW. Tell us about Dr. Lewis Zwick and his family and where he was, down in the South End. Yes, I didn't know too much of his family, but I knew him real well. He had so, two daughters. Yeah, and he, and he, he belonged to the uh, Fraternal Order of Eagles, and he was always there and mixing with us, and we had a lot of good times together. His wife was Esther Zwick. I believe so. And then he had a daughter, Ina. And the other daughter's name will come to me in a couple of minutes here. I can't think of it right this very second. But he had been a military doctor, had he not? Mm -hmm. And um, I can remember one time that the man fell prostrate in the field. And they called, at that time there was no EMS, and they called the hospital. The hospital couldn't send anyone out. And within a matter of minutes, Dr. Zwick was out there, and he went running. Now, he was a fairly That's big Dr. man. Dr. Zwick, he was always there. He was a big man, a fairly big man, a little on the gruff side, mm -hmm. he? but mm -hmm. the boy, he was a good doctor. Mm -hmm. He went running out to the middle of the field almost as if he were in battle and resuscitated that man. That man died at age 93. 
He at that time was probably 75 years of age, but he had, Dr. Swick not gone out there, but he knew exactly what to do, he knew how to do it, but the thing that he, what it, that impressed me was that this man got out of his car and ran at full speed to this man who was uh, lying on the ground. As a matter of fact, I think I might have been, well, somebody in my family, I was probably too young, but someone in my family called the doctor or the hospital or whatever, because as I say, there were no, uh, no EMS and no emergency response teams or anything like that, and uh, he would have died mm -hmm. he got there. Tell us a little bit more about Dr. Zwick and his um, uh, approach to people. Well, he, uh, he was, a, I would say, maybe a, a rather reserved person in, in approaching other people. He, uh, he, he, he didn't have a lot of personality, you no, might he say. Uh, a little bit on the gruff side. Yeah, and, but he was thorough. And, Very thorough. Yeah, and he'd do the things that needed to be done. And he, he always responded when I'd call him. That's where I had my close ties with him, was through the veterans. Now, tell us about the Veterans Association, or the Veterans Administration, and, and you were the program chairman, is that right? Uh, service officer, service that officer. Was, uh, the health and safety and so on. You had been in the service, right? Yes. Where were you in the service, J.D.? South Pacific. And in the Army? Yes. Mm -hmm. And were there any other wads of people with you at the time? No, not that I knew about when I was there, but after I got home, I, I was neighbors to quite a few of them down there. And who were some of the them. people who were in the, in the South Pacific that you were neighbors to? Well, uh, well, let's see. The guy from the post office in, in uh, Ripman, and I can't come up with his name. Well, it'll, come, it'll come to you. He was, I, I walked past his barracks every day for a long time. You I didn't know that. We worked at the injector together before he went to the post office. And, and, and you didn't know that. Baker. Baker. Baker? Yeah. Baker. And you didn't know that he was there. I didn't know he was there. What was Baker's first name? Well, uh, his brother was named Howard, and I don't remember his okay. first name. That's good. Howard enough. Baker lived in Silver Creek, uh, Silver, uh, River Sticks. River Sticks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, this wasn't Jack Baker, was it? Yes, you're right. Jack Big Baker. guy, Jack yeah. Baker. Mm -hmm. Jack Baker. I I sure you got the right job. <laughs> <laughs> and he was in the South Pacific too. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, when you were when you when you were with the veterans, or rather with the vet, the Legion, American Legion, and you were the um, service director, the VFW, VFW and service yeah. director. Um, what what kinds of things did you do, and for whom did you do them? Well, the ones that come home and had a disability, maybe hadn't had the proper attention, and getting pensions or care for them, or we worked with them, and as I said, getting them in for health reasons into Crow, and uh, families that needed help, uh, you know, the, right. and we, we took care of a lot of that. You mentioned Crow Hospital. Crow Hospital doesn't exist anymore. No. Tell us what Crow Hospital was and where it was and what we, what we did there. Well, I think it's torn down now. It is torn down. Yeah, right. And, and uh, it was a mammoth hospital. As I remember, it was all on one floor, one floor. and you just go down the hall and bunk after bunk after bunk. And what is there now, do you know? I don't know. I think the Cuyahoga Community College is I there right now. I don't know what there now. But where, how did you get there? I mean, tell us the road. I can't remember the road. I, I know we always went 90, No, we went 94. We went 94, to yeah. which is perfectly all right. Yeah, do it always that went well. that way then. 94. And uh, it was... Um, uh, on the south side of Cleveland, yes. that's correct, and there's a huge hospital oh. named after Dr. Cryle, mm -hmm. who was a, a big doctor in, uh, uh, in medicine. Now, um, what, uh, it was the Veterans Hospital for World War II veterans and World War I veterans, or anybody else, but yes, those anyone that served in the, in the service. In the service. And it was free, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, as I mentioned, my oldest brother was very severely wounded, and he spent quite a bit of time at Crown mm -hmm. Hospital mm -hmm. after he was, uh, mm -hmm. after they tried to rehabilitate him. Now, uh, getting back to um, the, the, the political angle here, uh, and I hate to think of you as a politician, just as I mentioned to some of the other people in previous interviews here, that I don't regard people in Wadsworth as being politicians. They're really statespeople. You know, you're a statesman because, um, oh yes, we have to play the game in October. You know, uh, I want you to vote for me, and I want. You. But after that, in Wadsworth, we just all get together and work hard. What did you start? Where did you start here in Wadsworth uh, in politics? Uh, you had been in politics and. Um, uh, Kentucky, but where did you start here in Wadsworth? 
Well, leading from that service director, service officer in the, in the VFW, I, I was elected commander there. and uh, Commander of the VFW? Yeah, and uh, I was in there for You mean two. I would have had to salute you had I been in the VFW? Oh, you bet time? you would. Well, I would. So come to the altar and pop your heels and get... <laughs> but I, anyhow... I know how to do that. I, I was such a... Uh, I was only a corporal in the service, and I had to do that so many times that I learned how to <laughs> do it well. Uh, you know, that, that was... Uh, uh, being commander was, it's not supposed to be political, but it was political. And it became more so now, and they do it nationally now. They're involved in politics in uh, any race, the president on down. Is that right? They want to involve themselves in. And uh, while I was commander there, well, I ran for ward councilman in Ward 3. Against a young fellow by the name of Zacchio. Yeah, Zacchio. And Zacchio beat me, I think, by one or two votes. One or two votes. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody encouraged me to run again, and so I ran mm, four times for count ward councilman, and won each time, and then I got ambition. And John Zacchio was just uh, temporary in Wadsworth, was he not? He moved from here to where? But he left he shortly after he was defeated the last time when I beat him. For, I think it was he, Yeah, I'm sure I ran against him. Yes, you he did. And, you yeah. went, and he went to Cleveland, or to Toledo, I believe. And, yes. But he was, a, he was a good counselor. What a wonderful person. Oh, was, yeah, uh, he was great. Good person. Um, he's another one of those persons who didn't let politics involve no. themselves. And he was, he's a good person. But yeah. you beat him, and then you became a ward councilman for four times. Who was the mayor during your first council uh, term? Mm -hmm. Jack Summers. Yeah, Jack Summers, another yeah. great man, yeah. great person. I think he was my yes. first. Yes, uh, just a fine person. Then beyond that, you went the second time. Every two years, mm -hmm. you'd have to run. Mm -hmm. Do you remember who, who the mayor was right after John? Uh, after Jack Summer. Jack Summer. I think it was Earl Gottwald. Earl Gottwald, the yeah. first time. Earl yeah. Gottwald was mayor twice. Yes, you know? yeah. And uh, then tell us what you did after you were in council for four years, or for four, uh, four terms. Well, I served as mayor. And how did you do that? What, what I actually did? Mm -hmm. Well, I had a very good council. And we worked very closely together, and we knew what was going on. And we were very fortunate in getting many things done. What were some of the things that happened during the, your, your uh, term as mayor? The terms, your, how many terms were in Two terms. Two terms. Mm -hmm. We had the uh, new water treatment plant. Up in, um, on, on Broad Street. Yes, mm -hmm. and then we had uh, the sanitary uh, sewage plant. Uh, Down uh, new, new. By the airport. And we upgraded the... Uh, sewer system around the city and ran it into the Sharon Township and that was a big project that released the land north of 76 for development. And uh, I think number one was possibly bringing new development business, business, industry and whatnot to the city of Wadsworth and we were very fortunate to do that for uh, one of the first moves we made was north of uh, 76 and they were uh, shooting rabbits and hunting in that spot where Bueller's and <laughs> Giant sure Eagle, were. and by the way, when we had the grand opening for the Giant Eagle, we opened that while the traffic was so heavy I couldn't get there, and there was a councilman by the name of Cesar Crino who was in charge when I got there, he took care of everything. <laughs> I you remember that? No, I surely do. As a matter of fact, the, um, uh, we were st standing in front of the store of um, Big Wheel or something like that. Yeah, Fisher Big, Big Wheel. Fisher Big Wheel. And uh, the manager, um, as managers need to do, wanted to get that store open because they wanted to bring all of these people who were there, oh, yeah. thousands of people there, and they wanted to they wanted to bring these people um, uh, into the store to, to buy. I mean, this ribbon cutting stuff was just fluff. They mm -hmm. wanted to bring these people into the store, and he he kept saying, <laughs> "Where's the mayor? Where's the mayor? Where's the mayor?" And I said, "Well, I'm sure." I said, "JD never is late." <laughs> I couldn't get there. The traffic. So was she, he said, "Well, he's late today." He says, "We got to get this thing moving." He said, "I'm going to cut the ribbon myself." So I said, "Well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I'm the only uh, person here from council, and I'll try my best." And uh, he said, "Well, you go ahead." So I That's got up good. and I said, "You know." Um, Mayor um, uh, Henson, unfortunately, um, has met with um, an unavoidable delay. 
and it was unavoidable because you couldn't get through. You couldn't I, get I through. Brought I brought it earlier, and I said, I'm so genuinely pleased that I was able to get here earlier. And he authorized me to tell, tell, in, tell you in his uh, stead that um, uh, he is really, really regretful of the fact that he was not be able to be here. So in his name, then, I'm going to cut this ribbon. And this, yeah. this manager kept saying, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. <laughs> so I got the scissors and I cut the ribbon, and boy, that was the end of the ceremony. Those people flocked into the <laughs> oh, you bet they did. just by the dozens. Well. I think it was maybe a half hour later that you showed up. I think it was. Yeah, and you, you said that I couldn't get through. That is true. And of course now we have made traffic lanes up there, but at that time there were no traffic lanes. It was just 94. That's before we widened 94. 94. That was important. We we, that was in progress then, I think. And while you were mayor, mayor that was in progress. Oh yeah, but we had only the two lanes up. Now, <laughs> you had mentioned something here that we were going to have to try to, to uh, pinpoint. Uh, you said you, you um, that's when the, the um, uh, development north of uh, the highway, which of course is 76. Do you remember, was it during your terms in um, council when the state started buying property for 76, or was that before your term? That was before my term. Do you remember anything about that? No, uh, nothing more than they built the highway there. They built the highway and they put the There was road. a lot of discussion about it at that time, whether they go through Wadsworth or go north of town. and. After that was resolved, why they moved forward on buying land and building the highway. And uh, evidently that is what caused the North End to blossom so much. Well, that certainly helped. Right. Well, now we need to know some of the intimate things. In the mayor's office at the time, who was your secretary, just out of curiosity? Barb Fish. Barb Fish. Barb, her maiden name Opplinger. was... Pardon me? Opplinger. No. Fish? No, no Barb, uh, her, her maiden name was an Opplinger. I always thought so. I don't think so. She's related to all the Oh, Oplingers. yeah, she's related to all of the Opplingers. Well, maybe it is. I don't know. Um, we'll, we'll get that straightened out here in a second, but I'm, I'm sure. But she was Barb Fish. Now, who was, who was Barb Fish married to? Chet Fish. Who was? Fire Chief. Our fire Chief. Do you remember how she met him? At the skating rink skating on the west rink. side. Uh, at that time, the, what is, was the colony, and now I understand that it's being made into a party center. Um, after school, the high school kids would go down there, and there was a professional skater. What was his name? Chet Fish. I guess he was a professional. He, he taught skating there. And, he taught skating. Yeah, mm -hmm. and he used to skate a lot when he was young. And Barb? was one of his students. Did you skate there? No. <laughs> I, I, um, first of all, um, I, I'm not the most graceful person. Another, another professional was George Mooney Mayer. George Mooney Mayer was one of the greatest there. skaters you've ever seen. Is that was, right? He was in his mid-70s when he was doing that, or in, in, at, seven, at least 70. George Mooney Mayer was um, a good skater. And we, we didn't say why we called him Mooney, right? No, I don't know. Well, they, uh, he had an eye that drooped. Oh, yeah, true. yeah. And they call that a moon eye. Mm -hmm. So instead, instead of saying moon eye maker, they call him Mooney Maker. Yeah. Matter of fact, I didn't know his name was George until I was yeah. you know, later on because we always called him Mooney Maker and everyone else called him Mooney Maker. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but Barb went down there after school and she met this Chet and she kind of liked Chet and Chet kind of liked her and then they got married. Mm -hmm. Then Barb went from there to work with whom? Do you Don remember? Merriman. Don Merriman. At he the worked store. For, she worked for years in the uh, store on in the College store Street. On College Street. Uh, do you remember that store of Don Merriman's in the College Street area? Very well. Could you just describe it to us and what did they sell and so forth? Well, they had two gas pumps. I believe it was two pumps out front and they had... Uh, do you remember what kind of gas it was? <laughs> no, I don't. Mobile, I believe, wasn't I it? I believe it was mobile. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, they sold a lot of uh, records. The records, yes. Uh, it was a record store more than anything. They bought more records than anything. And he had just general merchandise there. had very flourishing business. You know, they, um, and she worked for them for quite some time. Long time. How did you pick her as your secretary? Well, I knew her ever since I'd been in town, and she was a friend of my wife, and... Uh, was Barbara Freeman was her maiden name. Is that right? Freeman. Freeman. Yeah, I never knew that. I guess I did, and yeah. I forgot it. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, you, go ahead, you, you, she was a friend of Cora's. Yeah, she's a friend of Cora's, and so we just selected her, and she accepted. Barb Fish, of course, lost her husband. Yes. Um, he, her husband died on the golf courses, mm -hmm. I remember, mm -hmm. and they now have a, a uh, Chet Fish Open mm -hmm. in his honor, and uh, this certainly is fitting. And she now is married to Roger Dutt, yes. who lost his wife also. Yes. Roger Dutt was a, a year ahead of her in school, mm -hmm. maybe yeah. two years ahead of her in school. Who were some of the other people in the city at that time? The the uh, service director, the safety director, and and all of that. The service director was William Lyron. Bill Lyron. He has survived every mayor, and he is outstanding, and he certainly knows what to do. So you kept him on as service director, despite the fact that there might have been political differences. Is that I correct? Asked, I asked him to be my service director, and I said, I've watched you, and you've done a marvelous job for other mayors. And he says, well, if you select me, you'll see a better job. He says, I'll do you a good job, too. So that's how. And he did. He's he always did. been just absolutely outstanding. And we never had any problems. Who was your, who was your safety director? Fellow the name of Roy Luther. Roy Luther. Roy's now dead, isn't he? Yes. Now, he had a, uh, he worked for a while before that in um, uh, Curtis Electric, did he not? Yes. Yes, for in Curtis yes, Electric. Yes. How did you happen to pick Roy Luther as your safety director? We became friends when he uh, when he moved here from Indiana, and uh, we played golf together. And uh, he's I took a liking to him. He was always fair and always truthful. All straight up. And he never sidestepped anything. He come head on on anything he approached. Oh yeah, he, he didn't start hammer to it. He didn't change any when he became. No. Mm -hmm. And he was a good safety director. Let's talk just a couple seconds about uh, Curtis Electric. That was located on the south side of um, Broad. the Broad Street and right opposite the um, uh, the, the pavilion, or what do we call that, the bandstand mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And right there right now is where John Hanna's uh, uh, yeah. office is. Uh, do you remember that electric store at all? Oh, yeah, you bet I do. And. Mm -hmm. um, Curtis Electric was um, Bill Curtis and not the one who had Curtis um, clothing. No. A different Curtis. I, I believe, by the way, I believe Bill Curtis was on South Main Street just below the bank, therefore he moved over and had electric. That's right, that's yeah, right. I yeah, think you're right. Yeah. That's a good point. Uh, right below the bank, mm -hmm. Curtis Electric was before yeah. he worked over there because he, Pixel Electric used to be there. He had more room over there and he was getting big. He was selling yeah. a lot of refrigerators yeah, he was. and TVs and. Then Bixler Electric moved over to where the the um, um, jewelry store is mm -hmm. now, uh, Stonier's Jewelry Store <clears throat> on Cotty Street, and then they moved to right next door to where um, uh, Hoagland Hardware was and Holmesbrook mm -hmm. Hardware, and uh, where where that used to be a saloon where mm -hmm. they where mm -hmm. is right now Bob's Cafe, mm -hmm. Bob Sandals mm -hmm. Senior True. Uh, on that cafe. That's right. Now, uh, going back to uh, Curtis Electric, um, do you remember Dinah Curtis? Yes. Tell us about Dinah Curtis. What kind of a person was she? Well, she was a big asset to Bill, and she she uh, she attends the Methodist Church. I see her yet occasionally at the Methodist Church, and she she was a strong, strong person. Yes, she seems to be person. enjoying good health whenever I see her, and. But How old would Dinah be now? I have no idea. No idea, but boy, no. she was a good person. I, I, I used to admire her because you can get straight answers out of her. Oh, you bet you could. Just perfectly straight <laughs> answers. Let's go back to City Hall for a second. How big was the um, service department at the time that you were there? The service department, you yes. mean? Uh, right now, the service department has, you know. The uh, street department, the light department, they all fall under that yeah. other than the uh, police department and fire. Right. Mm -hmm. and now we, we now have the communications department yes, falling under I'm there. Yes, sure that expanded it quite a bit more. Right. And that was not there at that time no. because we didn't have t uh, public no. tele or that, the closed circuit television, no. the um, public TV, access yeah. television. So that's a, a new thing. Um, what were some of the problems that the service department had at that time? Now they're trying to get cable in, um, they're trying to get um, fiber optics in and so forth. What were some of the problems that uh, existed during that time, J.D.? The well, in the water department at that time, while we had uh, a shortage of water, I, I, I'm not sure about these figures. I, I think it's less than a million gallons we were treating at that time, and maybe 
a sizable amount was going through it wasn't being treated, mm -hmm. and uh, they tried to develop, we tried to develop more water for the city, and we went uh, searching for it in River Sticks and well field here, and I think they were up to maybe three million when I went out, I'm not sure. Pretty close to that, surely. Um, so that was the biggest problem we had in the service department. The street department was a pretty smooth operation, and, mm -hmm. and uh, the light department's always been a great operation. Oh, yes. and, uh, That's run separately from and, everything and else. And they all have high-tech people working in, right. in all of the jobs. J.D., the uh, um, service department, uh, the water problem still exists. Yes, I, I see. And that. I suspect that it always will exist. You know, it's just a, a matter of more people moving in and using more water and using more water. Our location with the divide, I read stuff about that. You That's know. right. What's the problem with our divide? Well, one time they talked about pumping it over the divide and using the River Sticks Creek to uh, bring it down to Wadsworth and damming it up. But uh, that all fell through. For I, I guess there's a law that you have to return the water to Lake Erie. And yep. you, if you, you get it from Lake Erie, you have to return yeah. it there. And we are right at the Continental Divide. That's you, right. Do you know exactly where that Continental Divide is? No, I don't. But I, I think it's north of the 57 going into River Sticks, up that way someplace. Up in that area, I think correct. I've been told that. Yeah. And everything north of that goes to Lake Erie, and everything south of that goes to, True. eventually, That's the correct. Atlantic Ocean goes down to the Ohio River That's and so correct. forth. So we're kind of <laughs> at the wrong spot at the right time. That's right, I said, the location. And we aren't going to change, because, yeah. so we'll have to figure out ways. So there are a lot of reasons that we have water problems, and it has nothing to do with the fact that water's not down there. It's the fact that we're so close to the Continental Divide. Yeah, we, we tried that low head dam, and I don't know what ever happened to that uh, in, in River Sticks, you know. I don't know what happened to that either, and... Uh, it was quite a conversation when we was in the office. My understanding is that if they treat surface water, they have to treat it differently from well yeah. water. Yeah, and now we have also that. well water, which... Yeah. Uh, and I think they're still trying, as a matter of fact, I know they're trying to develop the, mm. the well water. Who were the council people when you were um, mayor the first time? Do you remember them? Hmm. Cesar Crino. I was one. Chuck Johnston. Chuck Johnston was president of council. Bob Greenwald. Bob Greenwald. Ed Bates. Ed Bates. And... Foster. Foster. And who was in Ward 3? That's the one that I've got hanging up on here that I should know. Ward 3? I don't remember that guy. I know who he was. In Ward 3. He was an Italian boy. What was his name? No. Don't think so. Yeah. In Ward 3? Yeah. I don't know who he was. Well, we'll, we'll, come, we'll get to that one. We'll get to that one. What about um, the second time that you were mayor? About the same council. About the same council. Yeah, about the same council on many changes. And did uh, uh, you were in the old city hall? Correct? Well, yes. But the new part of the old city hall. Yes. All right. See, the old city hall was just a building with a fire department right next door to it, correct? That's and correct. And then they built onto that, and you were in the newer park. Mm, that's correct. Now, was the fire department right next door to the city hall at that time, or had they already built on Lyman Street? They had already built on Lyman Street. Okay, then they converted this to the fire department. Uh, into offices, is that correct? I believe that is correct. Yeah. And one of the problems in the old city hall, that had so many levels, I think you had to go upstairs every time you went anywhere, yeah. or downstairs when you went back. That's correct. And it was kind of difficult. In the old city hall, your office was in the southwest corner of the building right next to where the banks are now, correct? Correct. Of course, that building is torn down now. It's been torn down yeah. for two years, and we have a new city hall. You came out of your office, and there was your secretary. And I want you to tell us the name of the person who sat uh, in the other corner of the outer office. I could probably demonstrate it, and you could identify her. I can, OK. Who would, who would it be? But I remember one thing she said one time. They put a new carpet mm -hmm. throughout the offices, and color and everything was entered into it. and. Uh, she lit up her cigarette and looked up, and she says, I'll tell you something, pointing to me. She says, uh, let them have their carpet. But I have three places, three stations here. 
And I certainly don't want any carpet. I don't have to get out of this chair. All I have to do is kick and shove, and I'm over there. I kick and shove, I'm over here. I kick and shove, I'm at the window to take care of customers. And said, that's the only way I can handle it. And I'll bet you Dallas to donuts he didn't put any carpet no down. No carpet would no. <laughs> Because that And her cool. name was Thelma Schaefer. Thelma Schaefer. One of the greatest people I ever met, and she had, a, I think, a great part in my term when I was there. And Just I, a tremendous person. Thelma Schaefer worked for Bill Lyman, of course. Yeah. She was the service director, but she pretty well yeah, she was she was still Lyron's secretary, but she handled just about anything and it came in. that other people could have. <laughs> she was Thelma Way, W A Y. Yeah, Her that's, father was Pete correct. Way, and he was a foreman down at the uh, match shop, as mm -hmm. you remember. And he's a foreman of the uh, I think packing department, shipping department at one mm -hmm. time. Uh, nice guy, straight up also, and Thelma was exactly like that. Mm -hmm. Now she had worked at the mat shop for how many years? Do you know? I don't know, but she, she retired. Didn't she? she would. She would be at least ninety-six or seven years yeah, old. Yeah, she died not a few years back. Yeah, mm -hmm. but she retired from there and then came to work for the city. And she retired from the city after what, 20 years of service? Oh, longer than that. 25, maybe. She, was, she was up there pretty good when she retired. Oh, but what a powerful woman she was. I mean, no one messed with her. No. No. And um, everyone loved her. And despite the fact that she did not uh, coddle anybody, she, they just loved her. And uh, yeah. everyone was her child. I mean, you were her you, child. And you'd always was, remember her. Oh, you bet. Every day something would happen. Yeah. She uh, told me one time, she said, now, um, I, uh, something about we were having a Christmas party, and uh, that is for the, uh, we used to have the, the entire city Christmas party, one or two, well, the 21st of December. They cut that out now, but they used to have the Christmas party. And I walked in, she said, oh, come here. And I walked over there and she said, you're singing um, Joy to the World at the Christmas party. I said, oh, really? Yes, you are. I said, I didn't know, you know I was singing. So I don't know who's supposed mm -hmm. to tell you, but you're singing Joy for the World at the Christmas party, because I want you to. Mm -hmm. And do you know what I did? You sang Joy for the World at the, the, the Christmas That's party, right. because some of them wanted me to. But mm -hmm. she, was, she was all heart, she was very, very good. Oh, yeah. yeah. Her husband was, um, uh, was Franklin Schaefer. Schaefer. And they lived on West Street at the very, very end. I didn't know. Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah, As a matter of fact, I think the new sold, section. Uh, when she died, I think they sold her house to Bill Lyron's son. Yeah, right. Yeah, and uh, Bill Lyron took pretty good care of her and went to see oh, her yeah. the rest yeah. home and so forth. But she she died. Uh, some they never had any children. Mm. They had never had any children. Now Bill Lyman was in that office as well. There was a small conference room. Do you remember the first thing that uh, you one of the not the first thing that you purchased, but one of the first ones of that kind that was purchased. I think it was purchased during your administration, and that was the Xerox machine. Do you remember that? Sure do. There was only one in the entire building. And it was the kind, it was a, an old clunker, I mean, uh, the kind mm -hmm. that when you uh, put it in, mm -hmm. it would reduce it by 1%, mm -hmm. put the second one in, reduce it by 1%, it would never be able to get the full copy. And it was a novelty, uh, and only certain people who were permitted to use it and all of that. Now you walk into a, an office and they have a Xerox machine in the bathroom, almost, you know, <laughs> yeah. just have them all over the place. What were some of the, uh, who was the chief of police at the time? Right along here. Was yeah. my chief for a long time, and then Bernie Ty. And the two of them was only the two of them, the ones that you had. Of course, yes. Mike King is the chief of police now, but yeah. Bernie Ty. I think Mike went in maybe before I went out of the office, you know, near the end. Tell time. us about Rod Lonier. He was super guy, super person. And yeah. Tell us uh, what kinds of things he did to promote the, um, uh, the the police department. From you know, we had only one or two policemen at one time. It was. Um, uh, Tommy Lucas, and then we had uh, Ed Transu and Harv Weldy, and well, he all. I, one of the things, and I, I think, I, I, I don't think he ever succeeded. He wanted to pass a, a levy for for the police department, and my friendship with him was very close. And he thought sure that I would sign his petition, and he came in my office and he said, "Here, I want you to sign this. I want your name on that." And I looked and I said, "I can't sign that." <laughs> and he says, "Why not?" I said, "Well, every department in this." city would come with a petition for a special levy, and I don't want to put myself in that position. 
And I don't think he ever got it. I'm pretty sure he didn't get the police lady. I don't know. I don't think that he did. Uh, right now, however, anyone who works for the city is not permitted to sign a petition. Yeah. So they, they, yeah. They, 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 uh, the interpretation of the Hatch Act is, is that severe. Um, Bernie Ty. Bernie was one of our guests here the other day, and of course he's very humble in a lot of things, but tell us some of the great things that Bernie Ty did as a chief of police. Well, I, I think, I believe they organized their uh, union or uh, representatives come in and organize or something under Bernie, but, yep. and I think he handled that pretty well. He seemed to. Did it very beautifully. So they expected a lot of big trouble, and I, I think that one of, the, one, was one of the big things that happened under Bernie was the union. Bernie used to come to the to the um, council meetings, yeah. and I think that you had asked him to, mm -hmm. uh, and the safety director would come as well. Yeah. Then they stopped that for a while, but just recently I understand that the safety director as well as the mm -hmm. chief of police and the fire chief yeah. do come, because there are so many things that people can ask them directly, which mm -hmm. uh, no one else would know. Well, I certainly enjoyed being up there. I enjoyed all of them. We had real good working relationships oh, well, throughout the place. Of course, you're easy to get along with. You're and on I, the tough side, but you're easy to get along with. And uh, I got out without very many regrets. No, Everything went I'm real sure fine. Not. The council was very good to me. J.D., tell us about moving over to the fire station um, with some of the offices. Was that under your administration? Well, mostly after I left. Most of them after yeah. you left. Mm -hmm. They expanded a couple of times after I left. Carol Everhart was fire chief, I think, when I... No. I think he passed away before that. Yeah, I think that Carol died before still, yeah. that. Uh, you know, I worked at the injector for th around 37 years. Right. Mm -hmm. So you you had uh, a lot of those people that you might confuse whether you worked with them or not. Yeah. Together. Right. And I spent 37 um, years there, and as I said, I started in the grinding and cleaning, and uh, I was going to retire from the injector when I became mayor. and. The president of the company called me and says, we don't want you to retire. And I said, well, Isn't that wonderful? Who I was said, the president at the time? Howard Dean. Howard Dean called and said, don't retire. Yeah, and I said, well, uh, I can't very well handle a job down there and uh, be mayor. And uh, so that was the first four years. And by the time I got to the second four, I was full-time mayor. And oh, yeah. period, you know, I was there every day. And... Uh, he named some jobs, and I said, I think that would uh, take too much time. And he said, how would you like to be a consultant? And I said, consultant to whom? He said, to the president of the company. Good for him. And he said, you can't refuse that, can you? And I said, yes, but what would it necessitate? And he said, oh, assignments, you know, I'd sign you to different things. And he mentioned a few, and I said, that's right down my alley. And you did that. So I started in the cleaning and grinding, and I come out consultant to the president, the president. of the company. That's wonderful. <laughs> and we had, to, we had to import you from Kentucky to do that. <laughs> That's wonderful. And, and by the way, Mr. Young was real nice to me. And when we organized the union, I was chairman of the organizing committee. And there had been attempts made in the past, and they failed. And I sent him a letter telling him that I was instrumental in putting the union in there. And, gave him my name and uh, what I would be doing and uh, some of the good things that might be betterment for the company as well as the employees and so uh, that way I didn't get fired right away. I mean, well, that's what happens to a lot of people who meddle with the company business. And uh, after the union was in a while, uh, I got a call from his office and I went down. I, I thought, boy, I don't know what to expect now, you know. And he. Uh, more or less congratulated me for the staff that I had in the union and the things that how it operated. And also they had brought additional business in places they couldn't get in the door without union made stuff. So, so it did help. It worked out fine. It worked out fine. Yeah. Let's drop the, uh, not drop, let's, let's uh, switch just quickly because we're going to run out of time in a couple of minutes. So I'd like to hear more about the family of J.D. Henson. You have um, wife Cora, we just talked about her a little while ago. And um, she graduated from Wadsworth High School in 1939, Cora Ford, mm -hmm. and she's related to the Housens. Now, what about the offspring of 
J.D. and Cora Henson. I have one child, my son John Henson. He's a judge in Missoula, Montana. Missoula, Montana. Tell us about Missoula, Montana. He's been there about 20 years, I guess. What is Missoula? Missoula, what? Where it's is a one? city, but what's in Missoula? Oh, there isn't much industry out there. It's sawmills and things of that nature. But the most it? important thing in Missoula is the fact that it's a, um, a university town, is it not? True, they have a, yeah. a, one of the larger colleges in, in the state. And in fact, Missoula is maybe the second largest city in the state of Montana. In the state of Montana. And he's a judge there. He's a judge yeah. there, and he has three counties. He's, he's over three counties, and at one time he had five, and uh, those counties there could be 100 miles across. That's and unfortunate, he, yeah. And he, many times he'd travel on maybe 100 miles from where he lived to the furthest county that he serviced. And, uh, but it's down to three, as I said, and he enjoys it. And he says, uh, I asked him one time why he went to Montana. Well, he was already in politics, and he got his law degree at the University of Kentucky. And he went to work in the Department of Natural Resources in, in uh, Kentucky, and under a Democrat governor. And uh, the fall, uh, they elected a Republican governor, and they kept him on. And he did real well, but he was political minded. And he said, when I asked him why he was going to go to Montana and stay, he said, well, most of the people in Montana are Democrats. And he says, if I run for something out there, I'll possibly get elected. <laughs> A good thinking, good yeah. thinking. It's hard to become elected. So he's had, he's had real good luck ever since he's been there. Mm -hmm. Appointments and uh, elections. Well, that's and, wonderful. Now, does, does he have any children? Have one grandson, and he's in San Diego. I, met, uh, I, I visited him in February, Cor and I, and we had a wonderful time, and he's in a uh, big health, uh, uh, something like, uh, what's the big one over here, Parmatini, uh, the one that we have here in uh, Crystal Lake. So, oh, uh, oh, yes, right. In the Crystal, Kaiser, Kaiser, Kaiser Permanente. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. It's something like that, and he worked himself up real fast, and he's got a very good job there, and we enjoyed that. And his, we have one granddaughter, and she works in a law office in Missoula, and they both went to college. And my son graduated from, from a school up, a private school up in Washington State, and he majored in political science, but he hasn't used that because he got mixed up in the health plans. Health plan. and he says that's a, really a thing. Any great grandchildren? No. None yet. Mm -hmm. Neither one of them married. Neither one is married. That's what I see. Um, did uh, John, your son, Judge John, was he uh, a Wadsworth graduate? Yes. And what year did he graduate? 1958. 1958. So he's probably is 57 years old now. That's mm -hmm. that right. Mm -hmm. 57 or 50. It will be in September. 57 years old. In September, I believe. Um, so you were. Uh, about 23 or so when, uh, when you had him, and uh, with good blessings from the Lord, you're uh, mm -hmm. healthy, and you can see your sure. grandchildren. Sure. That's wonderful. There's nothing greater than this mm -hmm. life. Let's go back to your mayors just for a couple seconds. Um, I can remember when we were on council that um, the police department was so underfunded that they had farm tires on the, on the cruisers. Do you remember what you did about that? I, I don't really remember the farm tire. Oh, I that, do. That went over my head. I, I remember that as if it were yesterday, and I remember what you did about that. As a matter of fact, you probably don't remember exactly because you were standing talking to somebody else, and someone said to me, probably a patrolman or maybe it was Bernie or somebody said, you know, we have farm tires. I said, you have what tires? Oh, farm tires. I said, yes. And it says on the right on there, do not, do not <laughs> um, uh, travel over 40 miles an hour. I said, JD, did you hear that? And she said, hear what? And I said, I just repeated what he had said. Well, they'll have good tires by tomorrow. <laughs> so that afternoon then, I, whoever talked to me, I think, I'm not positive, I'm not positive, I think it was um, uh, one of the patrolmen who no longer is living, yeah. um, called and said, uh, thank you. I said, for what? I said, we have brand new tires on our car. <laughs> so oh, good. I said, well, I had nothing to do with it. So, you know, without yeah. even thinking, you said, well, you're not just, I don't care That's what right. you're doing. I, I think they're not doing it. You, you, you kind of probably thought to yourself, I don't care where the money's coming from, they're not going to have farm, farm tires That's on there. That's right. I think the word was farm tires, they called them on there. Uh, do you remember anything else? We're going to be running out of time in a couple of minutes here, but do you remember anything else with, of significance about your administration uh, that you'd like to share with us? And then I'm going to ask you two or three questions about your administration that you may not want to talk about because you're too too humble about that. 
Well, I think maybe the uh, development with all the utilities brought, brought the development in here. We got that going, we got the development, and I think that's been great. And the, apparently the various administrations that followed me has gone right along with more development and more expansion and, and everything's gone right along. And I think that, that created jobs and money and all the things that most politicians are talking about yet today. Well, that's very true. Um, there are those people who would like to see Wazith, you know, at 5,000 people yet, and maybe 10,000, and certainly don't want it to be more than 15,000, but it's going to get higher than that, and I, I guess legally there's no way that you can stop developing. I don't think so. No, no, no way at all. So what you have to do is to accept what's there and to try to provide for it. Do you remember uh, anything about um, a uh, policeman's strike? Yes. Tell us about the policeman's strike and how you handled that. Yeah. And probably because of your background in unions, yes. you were able to handle that just that quickly. I think <clears throat> they appreciated me, especially before they went on strike, maybe more, because I was involved in organized labor and familiar with all of it. But uh, I remember one morning they threw eggs on the window and whose window? On the mayor's window and uh, the mayor's window. And but uh, I never lost contact with their negotiators. We were hand in hand on a lot of things, and I knew where I stood all the time with them, and we didn't have any problem. We got the contract, and no hard feelings. The one that threw the went, uh, egg on the window was sitting in my office the next day after we signed the contract. Everything was happy. Did he wash it off? No, I think that the services that we had to take care of the windows. Uh, they took care of that. Yeah. But you knew who did it, right? Oh, yeah. But you never reprimanded him or anything no. of this nature. Yeah. That's one question I wanted to ask. The other question is um, your appointment of um, uh, Roy Luther. Um, who had been the service director, our safety director? Was it Jim Leadham? Or did Jim Leadham follow him? It must have been Jim Leadham. I don't know. I know that you, you agonized over that a great deal because uh, we, everyone in Wadsworth is a friend. You know, mm -hmm. It's sort of very difficult. But I think that um, when you, uh, when, when you uh, did this, it was not that you fired the safety director, but to think the safety director probably quit on his own because you're not that type of person. I think that you would have accepted anybody who would have been a good person. Um, a third question that I wanted to ask you, and, and, and I don't expect you to... Actually, remember. I had John Byers as my uh, safety director before Roy Luther. Before Roy Luther. Sure. John he, Byers. Yes. Right? And why did John leave? Do you remember? Well, there was, he had uh, more important things to do in his own job and his personal And he life. has become very, very well known in the polymer science field. Oh, yeah. Yes, he's, just yeah, he's top-notch he, he used to, and he, uh, he liked being safety director, and he did a marvelous job. He spent the hours, and he did all the figures, and, yeah. and he, he, he was very good. But uh, So then I went to Roy Luther. Then you went to Roy Luther after that. The last question that I'm about to ask you about your appointments uh, concern the um, appointments of your uh, commissions and so forth. As I remember, you tried to appoint equal numbers of Republicans and Democrats. Is that correct? That's correct. Now tell us why, somebody asked you that question, and I remember the answer, but tell us why <clears throat> you did that when many times uh, the person in power will, 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 will um, appoint only people from his or her own party. Tell us what, what the answer was. See if you remember it. Well, I, I, I don't, this might not be the correct answer, but I knew that it would be, it'd have more influence on the general public when a committee brought a report in and it would be Republicans and Democrats. And I know one time I was going to upgrade the planning and you possibly attended a meeting over here and we had approximately 100 people on that one planning committee, you know, that I appointed us. Right. Mm -hmm. I think there's only a couple of people that didn't serve and they were Republicans and Democrats and people who were knowledgeable of planning and some that wasn't, but it worked out real well. That's when we updated it. That's right. I still remember. I think it was around 100. What you said, and I, uh, it's something that has stuck in my mind. You said, 
I am the mayor of Wadsworth. Wadsworth is comprised of Republicans and Democrats. Therefore, Republicans and Democrats will have a say. That's right. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Yeah. J.D., our time is up, unfortunately. Okay. We're going to have to cut this and off at this point. Thank you very much for well, coming. Thank you. A real pleasure. Our only um, regret is that um, we can't continue uh, longer because time is has run out. Thanks, sir. Thank you, and I enjoyed it, and I feel honored that you'd have me here, and I was more than happy to come, and I hope I've added something to your program and to the city. You have. Thank you. Right.